just going to be reading um, this morning from Luke chapter 11, oh no, sorry, chapter 15, verse 11, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Um, if you could be upstanding, please, for the reading of scripture. Thank you. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine rose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best Uh, the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to celebrate now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in and his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, You killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Thanks so much, Tracy. Uh, Thank you all for being here. You're going to have a seat. Uh, If we haven't met, uh, my name's Arnaldo. I'm the pastor here. And uh, for this month, we will be working uh, through some parables, the parables of Jesus, uh, as we look towards our uh, celebrating our third birthday on uh, January 28th. Um, And next week, James is going to be looking at the parable of the hidden treasure for us. Uh, But today, We're going to be exploring the parable, the very well-known parable of the, uh, you may know it as a prodigal son, uh, but the parable of the two lost sons in the Gospel of Luke. And I want to remind us about what a parable is before we uh, get started. C.H. Dodd said that a parable is a metaphor or a simile drawn from nature or common life, uh, arresting its hearers by its vividness or its strangeness, and it leaves the mind in sufficient doubt of its precise application to tease it into active thought. And so, so parables um, uh, get us to confront um, our mental frameworks, and it, it, parables draw us in. They include us into the story. In, in effect, they force us to think. Uh, parables force us to redraw lines that we had drawn in uh, pen uh, when we should have drawn in pencil. They, they force us to question long-standing conclusions. Uh, parables are meant to inform the mind, but they're meant to go around the mind as well and inform the imagination. It's not just about how things are, uh, but they're how things can be, how they could be. And today we're exploring what is probably the most famous of all the parables. But before we do so, I want to ask you to help me to pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your goodness to us. We 
We thank you for enough health and energy to be here, Lord, and, and I pray now uh, that you would be with us, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, do something in this room, whatever it is you want to do. Wherever there may be people who are far from you, would you draw them near? Uh, where there may be discouragement, would you encourage? Uh, where there may be pride, would you humble? Uh, however we need you, Lord, to, to come to us today, we pray that you, you do that. Uh, I pray that you would help me to forget the things that are not going to be helpful for your people today and help me to remember the things that will be. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And the church said, and the church said, Amen. come back with me to, uh, some of you would have heard this story, but come back with me to June 1990. It's wild. Like that's the 20th century. I'm six years old and I'm finishing up my first year of kindergarten and schools in Brooklyn where I grew up weren't small. So uh, my school, my public school went from kindergarten to year five and there were six streams in the school and there were about uh, 30 to 35 kids in each class. And so uh, my, my primary school uh, would be around 1,000 to 1,200 kids, PS 290. And so you can imagine the absolute chaos at three o'clock where everyone was let out at the same time in Australia. You decide, you, you you teeter it off, which is, which is great, at least at the beginning. There, I mean, 3 o'clock, it was packed. And like a good businessman, Mr. Softy, the, uh, the ice cream truck would come around around 2.50, and you'd hear it, right? You're lining up to leave, and you, you hear Mr. Softy, and you know that, and they know that with enough coercing and enough whinging, they're going to make a lot of money at 3 o'clock, right? Because all the kids are out. And so my mom picks me up with my four older sisters, and a mom is little, you haven't met my mother. Uh, I hope one day you will if she comes here. Mom is 4'11", uh, but whatever she makes up, uh, whatever she lacks in stature, uh, man, personality, she's there. She's a large person personality-wise, but she loses track of us. She loses track of me, her favorite child. Imagine that. Imagine losing your favorite child, your baby boy. And we lived maybe 15 or 20 minutes away from uh, my school, uh, and I shrug my shoulders. She loses me. I can't find her in the sea of people, and so I just walk home. I'd never done that before. I mean, I'm, I'm six years old. I just, I just turned six years old. I, I don't know what I'm really doing, but I, I know that I'm on Fulton Street, and I'm on Skank Avenue, and I know if I walk up this, I know that I'll get home at some point. And so I walk. I don't remember being upset or scared. I was just a little bit lost, but no problem. I'll make it home. And as soon as I get to the front of my building, I hear, I mean, it was like a movie. It was great. This is probably my great, the greatest moment of my life, right? Like, a car pulls up, and I get dragged into the car. Now, I know the lady. Uh, but I get dragged into the car, and, and I, I hear this voice saying, Tu mamá te está buscando. Now, I'm not speaking in tongues. That's Spanish, which means your mom, she's looking for you. Right? I've been missing for what would seem like an eternity. And they grab me, they put me in the car, they drive me back to Fulton uh, Street and Skank Avenue, right where PS290 was. And if you could, if I, mean, I remember, I can picture it right now as I close my eyes, my mother being consoled by the crossing guard and where she laid eyes on me. It was inexpressible. Her, her, like, have you ever lost something? I remember losing Jonathan for about 25 seconds at a, 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 at a playground. And by, I mean, your heart goes into your throat. I mean, you're, you feel nauseated. It's just the worst when you lose something of value. And you've all lost something. A wedding ring, keys, wallets, and maybe not so much with the advent of the Apple AirTag, but you've all lost something. You've all felt that sort of punch in your gut. I'm actually in the middle of that at the moment. I, I lost, and, and my father doesn't, doesn't tune in. You know, he's in New York, but he doesn't watch YouTube. Where he, I don't think he knows what Spotify is, uh, but I lost his ring. And I, I'm, I'm in the middle right now of looking for it everywhere I go. And so I, I'm actually in the middle of losing something that's incredibly valuable. But that feeling, that suspense, that heart in your throat feeling that you get when you've lost something so valuable, so precious, is exactly what Luke 15 is all about. In fact, Jesus wants to drive home the point so clearly that he tells three stories in Luke 15, which we didn't read, three parables about this point. I mean, he, he wants to drive this home. He's not only telling one story, he tells three stories. He tells the story of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and then finally he tells the story of the one that we're going to be looking into, the lost sons. But I want you to come back up with me to uh, uh, verse 1 in Luke 15 uh, to set the scene. Now, the tax collectors and sinners... We're all drawing near to him. That is Jesus. 
And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And so we must understand that the reason why Jesus is about to say what he's about to say is because there are sinners uh, that are being attracted to him, and there are also Pharisees and scribes uh, who are critiquing him. And one of the things I love about Jesus is the cast of characters that you find him often hanging about in the Gospels. I find it incredibly intriguing that the holiest man who's ever lived, in fact, the only truly holy man who has ever walked the earth, attracted the outcasts of societies, attracted the folks that if they were to walk in this room, we'd smell them and we'd look at them funny, right? It's those people. And that needs to teach us something, both about uh, who we need to be, but what about holiness actually is. Because those who you wouldn't readily associate with holiness were always attracted to Jesus. That's, it's wild to me. And those who you would associate with holiness are always at loggerheads with Jesus. The outcasts, the sex workers, the thieving, the conniving tax collectors, the the sinners of all stripes and colors. These folks wanted to be around Jesus. They wanted to learn from him. Who is this man that is utterly holy and yet does not compromise? Jesus doesn't compromise and yet uh, people want to be around him. He became so adjacent to the seedy crowds that he gained the false reputation of being an alcoholic and a glutton. That's who Jesus is. But the point for us today is this, that he's telling this story or these series of stories to a a mixed crowd, to both sinners and to quote-unquote saints, to good people who we would consider religious good people. He's speaking both to those who would consider themselves by their own admissions, holy ones and unholy ones. And as such, Because this is Jesus, he doesn't give a lecture, he doesn't give a sermon, he tells a story. He redraws the lines of reality, and Jesus wants to give them and us a picture of just exactly. Remember, parables parables are windows, opaque windows at times, most of the time they're opaque windows, but they're windows through which we can actually see and experience the way God works. In simplest terms, parables are meant to be windows for us to see into the kingdom of God. How would act, this is the boiler room of the kingdom of God. God doesn't give us instructions as it were. He gives us stories. This is how the kingdom of God works. And so drop down with me to verse 11 where, where Tracy read for us. And he said, Jesus speaking, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And now what would happen? There were two sons, an older one, a younger one. The older one would get two thirds. The younger one would get a third of the inheritance. And what is probably here a fairly well off father, think probably upper middle class. The younger of the two sons makes an unthinkable, unthinkable request in that culture. In an individualistic Western culture like, like us, we, we, we often can miss the scandal of the story. The, the younger son, seeking to satisfy the desires and the lust of his heart and his body, is basically wishing death upon his father just so that he can get what is coming to him in due time. This would have sounded absolutely horrifying to Jesus' listeners, both sinners and saints at the time. I just can't stress just how bad this actually is. This is not the younger son asking for an advance on his paycheck for the week. This is a younger son making the claim, making his sonship no, and saying, I would rather have you dead, dad, and have what is coming to me in the future than have to wait for it. I mean, this would even, I mean, even for us, ugh, this would, this would be a bit icky, right? To ask your parents, hey, hey, like, can I have it now? I know, I know it's coming, right? You haven't been doing well. It's coming, but, but can I have it now? Like, just imagine your kid coming to you. Imagine you doing that. Look, it looks like you're living a little bit longer than expected. You look a little bit too sproutly, and I just can't wait it out. Like, I, I, just have, I have too many dreams for my life. I have too many desires that I need to uh, sort of work out, and, and I, just, I just can't wait. Could, could you just liquidate and just give me what's coming to me anyway. It's mine anyway. And without skipping a beat, you don't even 
know in the story how the father feels about this without skipping a beat. There's no reflection as to how he feels about it. The story doesn't tell us. Jesus doesn't afford us that. Without skipping a beat, no hesitation, his father, unlike any father that we can imagine, gives his son the full inherit, a full third of everything that he owns. Now I want us to pause for a moment. Remember who Jesus is telling, who, remember who's in the room when Jesus is telling the story. The Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law, the rule makers, the gatekeepers, the ones whose purpose in life was to be an exemplar of good behavior. Can you imagine the gasps in the room, the rolling of their eyes, their their biases of Jesus being confirmed that in fact he is not the son of God because this charlatan is parading around trying to destroy our way of life. Let's get back to the text now. Many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in what's called reckless living. An entire season of this young man's life in one verse. The first thing he does is he liquidates his newly given assets to make it easy for him to travel and fill up his passport, and he heads off to a far country. He doesn't know anybody, and nobody knows him. He moves from a very small village, probably around 300 people, to a place that's exotic, that's far away. He, he, goes, he goes to the L.A.s of the world. He goes to the New Yorks, the, the Sydneys, to the Londons. He gets away from everything and everyone he knows. And there's a real attraction, right? There's a real, there's a real attraction to this type, this type of anonymity where, where you don't know, like, right? You can do whatever you want because no one knows you. It's not going to get back, right? It's, like, it's not going to get back to this village over here. There's, there's no, like, there's no phone. Like, even when I was a kid, like, there's no phones. It's not going to get back. There's no, no way for anyone in his hometown to figure out, to find out what he was doing. He's a young guy. He gets a new wardrobe, a new donkey. He struts into a new town. And he's the guy. He is him. He's Timothy. He's the rich guy, the fun guy. Maybe he puts together a cool backstory about where he got to in his life. I mean, the, the, he is right now the picture of riches and success. He becomes an ancient influencer in this new town. And he sells you a packet about the fact that if you got up at 4 a.m. and you manifested your dreams while taking a nice bath, you too can have what he has. This is who he is. This is who he's pretending to be in this big city. He was able to construct a whole new narrative about his life, his identity apart from the community that he grew up with. No responsibilities, nothing to tie him down, a fat bankroll. He can do whatever he wants with whomever he wants, whenever he wants, and he goes wild, reckless. All that is captured in the words, reckless living. No discipline, no limits, no regrets, just memories. He's living his best life now. And maybe this was you, maybe this is you. But as quickly as he rose is as quickly as he comes down. And when he had spent everything. Yeah. 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 Amen. Someone's got the spirit. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. And actually... This, to us, to most of us, will, will, it will register in our minds that this is his rock bottom. This is not his rock bottom. He hasn't reached his rock bottom. This is bad, but it's going to get far worse for him. Right now, with all the money spent and all the fair-weather friends that he had, uh, you can imagine that he accumulated as he partied and binged. They're all gone. The economy tanks. There's a famine, and there is no hope. But this is not his rock bottom story. Yes, this is a Jewish boy who now who, who, who felt like a pimp at one time, now pimps himself out to a Gentile pig farmer and becomes so desperate. Now you have to understand, 
pigs were unclean. You could not eat swine as a Jewish person. And, 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 and the fact that now he is feeding pigs, and not only that, but he's desiring the pig's food. This is disgusting, even for us who will have pork. This is gross. It is utterly disgusting, even if you're not Jewish. But the fact that he would yearn to share a plate with an animal that was considered wholly unclean is another level of depravity, of depth. This is a, a whole new level of desperation that many of us probably have not experienced and may not ever experience. This is the kind of desperation that would ruin a life. And I'm not talking about just make a mistake. Ruin a life. This is the kind of desperation that would push someone to sell their children or their own body for just another hit. This kind of, de- this, is, this is a desperation that you can smell. The desperation that many of us, again, have never felt, seen, or been around. The kind of desperation that would make you do the unthinkable. The kind of desperation that would make you eat your words, I would never do that. And even at this point, you have to understand, he doesn't see his problem yet. Not yet. He doesn't see his deepest problem yet. At this point, the only thing he can feel is his hunger pangs. He's hungry and he's ashamed, but he hasn't felt the the true weight of the issue. Some of you have felt that. If not with food, you have felt your back up against the wall. You felt all hope drain from your heart. You you have felt stuck. You have felt depressed and anxious and suicidal. And even, uh, even if things may look okay for you on the outside, And you often will have plans to get out of it. And this boy has a plan. He has a plan. Verse 17. But when he came, it's like he, he, a bit of smelling salt. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise. This is his plan. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to my father. And I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, treat me as one of your hired servants. You see, he doesn't know what he doesn't know yet. He thinks that he's just broken a few cultural rules, and this means that he won't be accepted as a son again. He threw that away when he wished his father dead to have his inheritance, and he he knows about this cultural practice called kezaza. There's this cultural practice. Now, the text doesn't mention this cultural practice by name or even by inference, but you will indulge me to fill in some of the gaps in the story. Kenneth Bailey is a biblical commentator and theologian who lived many decades in the Middle East, uh, listening and learning uh, about the cultures that were, uh, are most closely related to those in Scripture. And this is what he says about Luke 15. He says, First century Jewish custom dictated that if a Jewish boy lost the family inheritance among the Gentiles and dared to return home, the community would break a large pot in front of him and cry out, so and so is cut off from his people. After it was performed, the community would have nothing to do with this wayward person. Everyone who's hearing this story knows about this. Everyone who's hearing this story is expecting this to happen. This would have been known to him, and so his plan was not to try to curry favor from his father in the community to be accepted as a son. Instead, he would plead. Plead to become a son. In effect, he wants to pay off his debt. And this, this is his rock bottom, right here. This little speech that he has, thinking that he can, in effect, earn his father's love, that's his rock bottom. And this is what we often miss. The fact that he thinks that he can earn his father's forgiveness and hopefully his affection, this is his rock bottom. We think that we see this, many of us see this as a younger son being sorry and experience repentance, which literally means a turning of face, but he's not. He comes home because he's hungry. He comes to himself. He goes, I don't, have to, I don't have to suffer this way. His motive isn't to mend the father's broken heart and trust. His motivation is simply to fill his stomach. And we may not like that. And we can see right through his duplicity. This is like, this is like when your kids are fighting and you force them to apologize. And they say, I'm sorry. And you know you don't mean it, but I accept it. And I know you don't mean it. You clearly don't. But I'll accept it. We know it's not genuine, 
but they hope that we accept it. And you can imagine that the younger son is hyping himself up as he's walking home. Just say sorry. Just look and sound genuine. At this point, he's making his long and shame-filled and guilt-filled trip home. And you can imagine that the religious folks, they're waiting for this pot to be broken. They're waiting for him to come home, and this pot to be broken in front of him, smashed in front of him, and expelled from the community. You can imagine that the tax collectors equally, and the sinners are equally waiting for this pot to break, and them leaving with shoulders slumped, ready for Jesus, Jesus to say, then they brought out the pot. And they smashed it to pieces in front of him and expelled him from the community. But maybe some of them knew better. Maybe some of them have been around Jesus for long enough at this point that he, they knew that Jesus was about to throw them a curveball. Because Jesus is, after all, the holiest man who's ever lived, but the father. But the father. So just enter into the scene with me. The son's coming home. He's tried to rehearse a repentance, an apology, and then, and then this happens. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no, longer wor- I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, he didn't even answer the son. He goes to the servants. He goes, quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And at this point, Jesus has stunned everybody. There's, there's, there's no jaw intact at this point. Everyone's jaws on the floor. Everyone is confused, both the religious and the irreligious. This is not the way the story was supposed to go. This is not the way many of us have experienced religious people. This is not the way many of us have experienced our own homecomings as we've wandered off track. You have to understand that no one expected this. No one in this culture could even, like, it it wasn't even a possibility for them to expect it. And yet, listen to this language. Still a long way off, his father saw him and felt what? I told you so. Right? Like, he was just waiting, he was waiting to give it to him or resentment, or anger, or pride, or disgust, or disappointment, all things that none of us would charge him wrong to feel. Compassion. He feels compassion. Splachnizomai is the word. That's the same word that Jesus feels when he approaches the tomb of Lazarus. He, 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 this, he gets a stomach ache. This is, this is what the word actually means, where your guts churn. This is the same feeling that Jesus feels when he looks at death. In our culture, we would say that his heart broke. In, in our culture, we, we, we don't see the gut as a center. We see the heart as a center. His heart broke. His heart wrenched when he saw his son. Have you ever been heartbroken? Have you ever been hurt by the ones that were supposed to love you, protect you, be for you? The father's guts churned, his heart broke for the one who wished his own death and betrayed the entire family and the community. And even before the son gets out his entire rehearsed and hollow pseudo-repentance, his father pulls out all the stops. The best robe, not just any robe, the best robe, not just any ring, the family ring, the one that I lost, right? Not, 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 Not just any calf. The fattened calf. He pulls out all the stops. This is the father. Listen, this is the father making the son a son again, not a slave. There was no broken pots in this story, and they celebrated. And I wonder, why isn't this the dominant picture in our church today? Have we forgotten what happens in heaven when one person, one sinner repents, when someone who's lost finds home, when someone repents and submits their lives to Jesus, messed up, jacked up and all. 
When someone pledges their allegiance to the kingdom of God, when a a wandering son or daughter lets themselves be found by grace, have we forgotten that the Holy Scriptures end with the greatest party you can ever imagine? Like, move over, P. Diddy's white parties. Move over. Like, any, any party that you can imagine that this culture can throw at you, the Scriptures end with a party, with a celebration. And the story can end for us here. We love this. Lavish grace, undeserved mercy. And us religious folks, right, who haven't lived lives of debauchery or squandered our resources with loose living, our pride can stay intact at this point in the story if we're focusing on just one of the sons. But Jesus leaves no no stone unturned and no heart intact. He exposes us all because the point of the story is this, that there are two ways to be lost. We, 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 we're, we're, we're cool. Like the, the, the younger, that makes sense to us. That's, that looks lost. But there's another way to be lost. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and he drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, not even my brother, not even my, you know, you, you know how you can separate yourself from your family. I go to Catherine and be like, yo, your kids are wild. <laughs> but when this son of yours comes, came, you, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. You see, up until this point, the story was so clear. You have a father uh, who is abundantly and counterculturally generous, what many, even in this room, would consider a foolish man. He, he, we can consider him a, a foolish He liquidates his, 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 his estate, and he gives a whole third for his son to squander and reckless. He's a foolish man. I mean, forgive, but not forget, right? To accept him back into the family. He could have accepted him as a slave and let him pay off his debts and at least then accepted him as a son. What a terrible holder of estate. What a horrible manager of funds and assets. But the story was simple. You have a younger son who is a complete screw-up in the shame of the family. Some of us are in this room. You have an older son who is dutiful, does the right thing, and stays home to perpetuate the family, legacy, and name. But when the party begins, the true colors start to bleed through. One of the true colors, our true colors, the, the colors of our character bleed through the pages of our false selves when we become stressed or agitated and we don't get what we want. The older brother felt what well, we all expected the father to feel, what we may be feeling towards our own younger brothers in our lives, anger and resentment. This is the, the, the way that this story ends shows us that it, it is not about a lost father, uh, uh, sorry, a, a generous father and a lost son. It is about a father and two lost sons. There are two ways to be lost. And one is far worse, far worse than the other one. You see, there's more than one way to be lost in the way that the older son reveals his heart towards his brother and his father shows us that you can be equally, and I want to say even more dangerously lost through duty and obedience in the church than being outside of the church. And this is the point of the story. Both sons want to buy their way into the father's heart by doing what they need to do, by thinking that they can earn their way into his affections. They both end up breaking his heart. You see, many of us have been taught something so incredibly false and dangerous about Jesus and about Christianity. The idea is this, that if we behave right, that if we act correct, That if we do all the right things, if we get baptized and if we say our prayers, if we take communion, if we go to church, if we read our Bibles, then those things in and of themselves will put God in our debt 
and he somehow owes us then. Somehow, we've done him a favor by being here. Somehow, we think that the Lord of glory owes us something because we do the right things. A lot of churches shun younger brothers and create older ones. A lot of our churches teach us how to behave rightly externally without the disposition of the heart being one of love towards the Father. And in so doing, we become more lost than we can ever imagine. Listen, when you're lost out in the world, at least you know. It's, it, you can smell it. But when we put our cologne and deodorant and our best on Sundays... You, we can be far more lost than we could ever imagine if we think that we can earn our way into the Father's love. You see, Jesus is on about bringing renewal to everything that sin and death has touched. This includes our hearts, the center of our beings, and not just our hearts, but every single part of our uh, uh, world around us. Everything that uh, a sin has disrupted and vandalized is healed in Jesus, all the way down to our relationships with the earth, our relationships with one another, our relationships even to our very selves. And ultimately, the greatest fissure in the world, our relationship with the one who's created us. And the problem with the ways of God is that they go against the grain of the ways of us. Because we want to prove ourselves. I want to prove myself. You want to prove yourself. We, we want to make our own way. We want to forge our own paths to heaven. We measure ourselves up against others and we say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm not Leopold. I'm not Hitler. So we think we're okay. But this is the good news. That while you were far off, listen. Listen. While you were far off, and there's no one immune to this, that while you were far off, God's loving, compassionate grace was already upon you. And this is the good news, that you can stop trying to earn your way into heaven and receive his lavish grace. This is the good news, that you are so broken that you needed God to come and die for you, and you are so loved that he was glad to do so. And all of this is free. Isaiah 55 says this, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy. That doesn't make any sense. I, I got no money, but this is, this, is, this is how the kingdom works. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which was, does not satisfy? Listen diligently. Open your ears to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. This is why Luke 15 is so incredibly important because it gives us the plainest language and the plainest word pictures for God's heart towards his wayward and sinful people of which we all are. It's a heart full of love. It's a heart deep with compassion, a heart that sees you when you are far off. God is not waiting for you to clean yourself up to love you. The idea that we've had is that once we believe in Jesus, then God loves us. So somehow... He doesn't love me, and then I trust in Jesus, and then he does. That is false. That is putting the cart before the horse. Listen, the cross doesn't get God to love you. The cross is an expression that God already does love you. A heart that longs for you, even when we're, you're trying to earn your own way by being good. A heart that longs for you even when you are far away from him by being quote-unquote bad. A story that shows us that there are in fact two ways to be lost. By being licentious, going off, living a wild life, porn, sex, drugs, getting drunk, cheating, gambling. And equally lost are those who take communion. So we need to check ourselves. Thinking that what we do earns us God's love. It's a beautiful and subversive story that draws us in, and it's full of twists and turns. It's a story of free and scandalous grace. Bring the best robe. Bring the family ring. It's a story not of a prodigal son, but of a prodigal God, a prodigal dad, 
who gives away all he has freely to his kids who have broken his heart, not just a couple of rules. And this is the invitation that we have to navigate this story as, as we navigate this story today, and it's to see God afresh. I want to invite the band up. I'm almost done, I think. This is the invitation that imagine right now, and I, I, like, I know, you know, I say this all the time. I'm actually asking you to do this, right? Imagine, imagine right now, if God brings you to the fore of his mind, what does he feel? What does he see? What does he sense? Is he disappointed? Do you, do you think he's angry at you? Is he disgusted with you? Is he wagging his, where, how are his eyebrows? Are they furrowed towards you? Because if this story shows us anything, it's this. That forever, forever, the Father's gaze towards you is one of compassion. That is how he's looking at you today, in your mess and in your attempt to earn his love. Compassion towards you, even as you earn your way in. He goes out to the older son. He entreats him. He wants him to come into the party. Compassion towards you as you go your own way and squander his good gifts. Compassion because he simply wants you home. This could be your, this may very well be your story today. Maybe you've tried all your life to follow the rules like the older brother, but still feeling this gnawing sense of confusion or lostness or emptiness or depression or anxiety, worthlessness, frustration, anger, or pride. Maybe you find yourself constantly judging other people's spiritual walk. The Father is inviting you today to come home, to come home to the party and to celebrate. Maybe you've tried all your life to run away like the younger son and your inner life feels like a famine has hit. Your, your invitation is to come home because he is waiting for you. You don't have to sort yourself out before coming home. He looks to his younger son, no shoes, destitute. You know he stunk. And you know what he does? He kisses him. Now, this wasn't like a polite, I'm not going to mess up your, your makeup kiss. No. This was gross. And he kept on kissing him. He wrestled him to the ground. Listen, this is how God sees you. He wants to wrestle you to the ground and show you his deep affection for you. That when we go off on our own way, he just wants you to come home. You know, there's a beautiful promise at the end of the story, the, the story of the Bible, where it says that God is going to wipe away every tear from our, our eyes. So it's a beautiful promise. And we assume then that there will be no more crying in the new heavens and the new earth, and maybe there won't. But allow me to go beyond the bounds of Scripture here for a moment. Imagine with me that for every tear that he wipes away from your face, he sheds out of joy. There, there's happy tears. Not tears of sadness, but tears of joy. Tears because he has his kids come home. How I want you to taste and experience that for yourself today. And none of this is possible because we are good. You have to understand, none of this is possible because we somehow achieve a level of goodness or badness. We're, we're given the royal robe because Jesus took his off. We are given, we're gifted the signet ring of the family, the Holy Spirit, because Jesus on the cross was forsaken. The fattened calf that was slaughtered for the sake of the younger brother represents someone else who was slain like a lamb for you, for me, for the renewal of all things to create a community that would embody the ways of the kingdom. Paul reminds us in the book of Philippians that God who is all and had all and has all took off his glory to enter into our situation. The question is, will this be our story? Will you let yourself be found today? You may be here and you've never pledged your allegiance to Jesus. Your invitation is to come home. 
And if this is you, I'd love to pray with you after the service. Sam is going to be up here praying for folks as well. Uh, you may be here and you may have realized that you've tried to earn your way into the kingdom. Your invitation is to repent and to come home into the party and celebrate the free grace that was given to us. I want you to know and remember that when one sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. And so let's pray that this church becomes and remains a church for the outcast, for those who feel like their grace has run out. Let's pray that this church becomes and remains a church that dismantles the idea that we could ever earn our way into heaven. And let's pray that this church becomes and remains a church that sees many wayward sons and daughters come home. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that today we sit here, we stand here, not as folks who have earned our way in, not as folks who are too bad for grace. Where sin is, grace will abound evermore. And so we can be honest. We can confess, we can repent, we can come because it is a throne of not judgment that we meet, but grace. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray right now that though there may be people here in this room who don't, have not pledged allegiance to Jesus, would they do so today? Would they pledge, would they bend the knee to Jesus today? Would they see you, Lord, as beautiful? Would they see you as waiting with compassionate arms, with tears in your eyes, not out of anger or condemnation, but tears because you simply want your kids home? And may we shed, Lord, the false layers of thinking that we can somehow be good enough to earn your favor and help us to receive the grace to come into the party and to celebrate with you. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. And we pray that you would be honored by our worship now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And amen. One of the things we do as an embodied response uh, to the gospel of grace is that we take communion, we take the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, and, and it's a Thanksgiving meal where if you follow Jesus, if you know him, if he is your Lord and your Savior, we invite you uh, to come up as we sing uh, to take the bread and to take the juice representing his, his broken body and his, broken, uh, his spilled blood for our sake. So I invite you to do that as we sing.